All right, so we're back. Week two was kind of crazy. There was a lot that happened. We're going to talk a little bit about each team, and uh, yeah, let's get into it. Bills, Dolphins. Obviously, the Bills, there was a lot of talk about the Bills' demise. That is on hold. The 2-0, they dominated Miami, obviously, with Tua's injury. There's a lot more to be worried about on that side, but the offense isn't as explosive, but it looks more methodical, and it looks more balanced. And the defense, although it was injured, they battle, and having Josh Allen doesn't hurt them in the slightest. It's really cool to see the Bills be 2-0, but on the flip side, obviously, Miami. I mean, there's really only one concern based on this last game. It's to his health. It's a massive concern. There's nothing else to say. He needs to get healthy and take a long look in the mirror. And the Dolphins are in trouble while he's gone. We're going to see what Skylar Thompson is really made of. Next up, I want to talk about the Colts and the Packers game. For the Colts, the run defense is going to be the demise of this team. They knew going into this game that they were going to be no Jordan Love. And so they knew they were going to lean on Josh Jacobs in the run game. And the Colts allowed 261 rushing yards. Getting their season total to 474 rushing yards in just two games. And DeForest Buckner suffered an injury, which is just going to make things worse. They're going to have to short that up very quickly. For the Packers, the blueprint to win games is there. Lean on the run game. Lean on the defense. Don't rely on Malik Willis to do too much. Let him make timely throws. And if he can, they're going to be in a good spot. And again, Jordan Love, he'll be back in, I would say, a couple weeks at max. So as long as they can do that and stay afloat, they're going to be in a good spot. Saints Cowboys, obviously the Cowboys, their defense just got thrashed by the Saints. They scored touchdowns on their first six drives. And that was the story of the entire game. If they want to compete for a championship, the defense needs to play at a much higher level. And if they don't, they're going to be in trouble. And for the Saints on the flip side, they are continuing to prove that their start is for real. Obviously last week they played the Panthers, a dumpster fire, but this is the Cowboys. Both sides of the ball are playing like a unit. Derek Carr, Alvin Kamara, both look really good. The offense played great. Even the defense was super physical and opportunistic. The Saints look legit. Next up, I want to talk about the Patriots and the Seahawks. For the Patriots, how much longer are we going to wait until we see Jake May? They wanted a veteran quarterback to start the season under center, but Jacoby Brissett's limitations are coming to light a lot faster than I think the Patriots anticipated. And they want to push the ball down the field, but that is averaging, like I think I'm looking at it right now, 5.3 yards per attempt. If they want to push the ball down the field, how much longer are they going to keep Drake May on the bench? And for the Seahawks, they're 2-0. But at the end of the day, Geno Smith does need help. He can't do it all. The run game needs to be better. Kenneth Walker has to get healthy. Zach Charbonnet only averaged 2.7 yards per carry. And the Patriots hit or smack Geno Smith 10 different times. If he gets hurt, they're screwed. So they have to keep him healthy and they have to play better football. For the Panthers, it's officially time to worry about Bryce Young. Obviously, they benched him. He struggled mightily this season. I don't think benching him is the right call. I don't really understand why they did it, especially after Dave Candlemas came out and said that Bryce Young is their guy like 24 hours before they announced his benching. I mean, Andy Dalton isn't going to, like, he's not going to raise the ceiling on this team. And objectively, what good does it do if they, he does make like a Joe Flacco type run like they did last year? I'm not saying he will, but what the good does that do for your long term, like, outlook like to me is you have to develop Bryce Young or you trade him in tank and you try to get you know Quinn Ewers or someone next year I mean back to Bryce Young though like he's made questionable decisions throwing the ball and in the pocket with the benching Carolina might be giving up on him already and and I don't know if that's the right thing to do but it sucks to be a Carolina Panthers fan right now and for the Chargers J.K. Dobbins is a powerhouse in this Chargers offense when Jim Harbaugh took over it was kind of you know, kind of anticipated that they were going to lead more on the defense and on the run game. And they've done just that. As long as he can stay healthy, J.K. Dobbins is going to be a factor in this offense. And the Chargers are going to be sneaky good. Next up, let's talk about the Niners and the Vikings. The Niners, McCaffrey's injury is not the only problem for the 49ers. Um, Jordan Mason has been very comfortable in the short term. And the offense really has looked fine amidst the injuries, except for Brock Purdy's made some questionable decisions, not being able to read schemes. Obviously, Vikings, their defense is legit. But the Niners' defense was super ineffective against the Vikings, and having a punt blocked on special teams is a terrible look. They have to shore up those sides of the ball if they want to compete without McCaffrey or Debo. And for the Vikings, the Vikings can go far with Sam Darnold, right? The 49ers are the cream of the crop of the NFL, and the Vikings' defense was everywhere on Sunday. And Sam Darnold played well enough. He did have some incredible throws. The 97-yard touchdown to Justin Jefferson. A lot of that was him, but that was a hell of a throw from him. Vikings, I'm, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say they're back, and I'm not going to sit here and say they're playoff contenders or Super Bowl contenders, but they look feisty as shit. Next up, let's head to Tampa Bay and Detroit. Detroit, they're a good team, but they're not the cream of the crop in the NFC just yet. The team played great. Defense and weapons were flying around, but Detroit failed to make a lot of timely plays that the Buccaneers and Baker did, and we're going to talk about that in a second. And that was the difference in this game, right? And that's going to come with experience as good as this Detroit Lions team is they're very inexperienced in terms of playoff experience and things like that especially in key positions so they're just going to continue to develop it's going to help them but right now obviously that's not what the case and for Tampa Baker has continued his resurgence he's showing that he is the perfect QB for the Buccaneers they're 2-0 and that's obviously large part because of him he wasn't perfect against the Lions but he consistently made timely play after play you know on the flip side the Lions didn't and finding a way to win game on the road 
in Detroit is no small feat. Shout out to the Baker and shout out to the Buccaneers. Again, the AFC South, the Falcons, the Bucks, the Saints, it's a lot, a lot tougher than a lot of people thought. Cleveland and Jacksonville. That's what I want to talk about next. The Jags, Jags are disappointing, if we're being honest. At some points, the team is so up and down, they look like they're destined for a deep playoff run. And other teams, they just kind of fall apart. I'm not too disappointed in them because the AFC kind of looks very up and down right now. They're a couple good games away from being right back in the mix. They just got to sort things out. In Cleveland, right? They can win with an average Deshaun Watson. I'm not going to sit here and say they're going to win the division or that they're going to go very far in the playoffs with an average Deshaun Watson. But in terms of staying in games, they can do that. They just can't make mental mistakes. Cleveland's defense is elite. I'm talking elite. And they can ride that to wins as long as the rushing attack continues at the pace it's at. They're going to get Nick Chubb back, hopefully. And when they do that, it's only going to get tougher for opposing defenses. Next up, Tennessee and New York. This is another really weird game. For the Tennessee Titans, their offense is boom or bust, right? Will Levis, he is an experience. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. He's an experience. His arm allows him to make incredible plays and throws on the field, but sometimes, as referenced in both games this season, his brain makes leads him to make very questionable decisions. That theoretically cost his team the game, and if he can fix that part of his game, the Titans, are, they might make some noise in the AFC. And for the Jets, their backfield is going to be the key to unlocking this offense. A healthy run game is going to be the key to keeping defenses honest. The addition of Braylon Allen and the Brees Hall coming back from injury is going to open up the run and the pass game for Aaron Rodgers, and that's going to make things so much different for the Jets. Again, Jets a team that people get a lot of question marks with them. They're one and one so far, but at the end of the day, I think the Jets can make a real run, especially with the AFC, again, looking very murky this season. The Giants and the Commanders. This is a very, I'd be shocked if a lot of people watch this game. But the Giants, they often show signs of life, right? And that's huge. They're super inconsistent. And the kicking is a major issue without Graham Gano. But the defense needs to be able to get off the field, right? And if it can't, it's going to be a long season for the Giants. And for the Commanders, they can rely on their ground game while Jaden Daniels gets better. Even though they didn't score a touchdown, seven field goals is fucking insane, by the way. The offense racked up 215 rushing yards between Brian Robinson and Jane Daniels, and they have 353 rushing yards through two games. That's like 175 a game. That's a lot. And for them being able to move the ball while Jane Daniels develops, that's huge. It allows him to develop at his own pace, not feeling too rushed, not feeling pressed to make throws and do things like that, and that's huge for development. Next up, let's head out west as the Raiders took on the Ravens. For the Raiders, their offense got some crazy positive momentum. The defense has played amazing. The Raiders still only scored six points in that first half. But the offense finally got going in the second half as Devontae Adams and Brock Bowers combined for 18 catches, 208 yards, and a touchdown just in the second half. I had to make sure I was reading that right because that's a lot. And after only scoring 10 points in the first game, getting 20 points in the second half, that's something you can lean on. You can be like, hey, we can point to that and be like, hey, played well in the second half. we got to build on that. And for the Ravens, they're going to have to lean on the run game. Obviously, not many teams have a Max Crosby wreaking havoc on an offensive line, but Lamar didn't have a clean pocket much of that entire game. And the Ravens defense allowed 27 points per game for, through these first two games. The Ravens are going to have to lean on Derrick Henry in the ground game just to kind of control the time of possession and win games that way. And that's different than they've usually done it. But again, this is a different team. Staying out West, Rams, Cardinals. This was a shocker, right? The Rams, obviously, the injuries are starting to add up. You already lost Puka. You lost multiple offensive linemen. Cooper Cup goes down. Without an explosive offense, the defense, the Rams are going to have a tough time compensating for them. They've allowed 400 yards in three touchdowns on the ground in just two games. That's over 200 yards a game, a touchdown and a half a game on the ground. It's going to be really tough in LA. But for the Cardinals, their offense is super balanced. And it's kind of the first time we've seen that in a couple of years. And that could lead to a rise of the standings, especially with the division kind of looking shaky out west. I'm looking at this right now. James Conner ran for 122 yards and a touchdown. Marvin Harrison on just four receptions, 130 yards and two touchdowns. Kyler was great. He also had 60 yards on the ground. Trey McBride has been an underrated addition at tight end. And they've even scored on a kick return, not in this past game, but obviously in week one. Even without a reliable defense, the offense being as explosive as it is, it makes the Cardinals a tough out. Next up, I want to talk about the Steelers and the Broncos game. For the Steelers, as much as it pains me to say this, the Steelers are winning games despite Justin Fields. He's not hurting them, but he's definitely not helping them. The offense has relied on the run game a lot. Running the ball, I think it's, yeah, 62% of the time. That's insane. That is insane. It's not going to be pretty, but it's been successful for the Steelers in the past, and they're going to continue to try to win games that way. And for the Broncos, I did write a lot of this down for the Broncos because I wanted to talk about a lot of these numbers specifically. They're going to have to throw the ball down the field to have success. Right now, Bo Nix's inability to threaten defenses vertically is hampering the offense so much. Bo Nix in two games is six for 24 with three interceptions and throws 10 plus yards down the field. If that doesn't improve quickly, I'm sure it already hasn't. Defenses are just going to pack the like the first 10 yards from the line of scrimmage, and it's going to make the Broncos offense hell. Next up, 
Bengals Chiefs, the Bengals are going to bounce back from this 0-2 start. We've seen this movie before. The last two times they started 0-2 with Joe Burrow healthy, they had winning records and went to the AFC Championship game. The Bengals are going to be fine. We've seen this movie before. They have a great team. they got a lot of talent. Obviously, Jamar Chase kind of getting locked up on McDuffie Island was kind of interesting because he blew up. He needs to control his emotions, but they're going to be fine. And for the Chiefs, I know it's a weird thing to think about, but they're going to have to continue to win games in this manner if they want to 3 beat. They've kept a decent amount of this team this entire time, but winning close games, it continuously increases your championship medal. And it's not like the Ravens or the Bengals are scrubs, right? These are two teams that we expected to challenge the Chiefs, and they did. It's just going to help the Chiefs down the stretch, being able to know that we've done this before, we've won these close games. It's going to do nothing but help the Chiefs. In this Sunday night game, it was Texans, Bears. We're going to talk about the Bears first. Caleb Williams is struggling, but it's normal. He's a rookie. CJ Stroud is the exception, not the rule. And objectively, not all his fault. Again, I wrote down a lot of numbers for this. Caleb Williams in the Bears offense was split 42% of the time on his dropbacks, the absolute highest number since D'Amico Ryans became head coach of the Texans. Caleb Williams only completed three of his 12 attempts, getting sacked five times and throwing an interception. So obviously the blitz protection wasn't there. He was flustered. You know, it happens. He was pressured. I'm not sure if this is correct because I got this from Twitter.com. But watching the game, it sure felt like it. He was pressured a court, like on like 36 of his 37 dropbacks irrespective of it being a blitz or not. That is unreal. Anybody would struggle in that environment. God would struggle in that environment. On the flip side for the Texans, Nico Collins is the guy, right? I know they brought in Stephon Diggs, but Collins, eight receptions, 135 yards, and the only touchdown. He has 252 receiving yards this year alone. Again, more numbers. Diggs only has 70 yards in two games. I'm talking both games. Tank Dell only has 37. Joe Mixon, the running back, is third on the team with 44, yeah, 44 receiving yards. Nico Collins has 101 more rushing yards than all three of them combined. He's the guy. And finally, Falcons Eagles. The Eagles, their defense is still a major concern. I know people want to talk about the decision to pass on third and three from the Falcons 10. Two minutes remaining. The Falcons don't have any timeouts. But if Saquon Barkley catches that ball, they score a touchdown and they win that game, right? So Sugrani looks like a genius. That's not on him. Saquon Barkley has to catch that ball. But the Eagles defense allowing 150 yards and six yards per carry on the ground. The defense doesn't look any better than it did last year. Obviously, in the secondary, they made a lot of additions. And they were able to stop the Falcons passing offense outside of the Darnell Mooney play. But at the end of the day, the front seven needs to be able to stop the run. And for the Falcons, they can win a lot of games. I know the first game against the Steelers didn't look too good. Kirk Cousins was rusty. He still doesn't look like the Kirk Cousins we saw in Minnesota. But they grinded this game out, and Kirk Cousins came alive in that final drive. Driving down, getting uh, hitting Drake London for that final touchdown with 34 seconds left. They relied on Bijan, Tyler Gear, and the defense. They used the passing game in a complimentary fashion, and it worked. Once Kirk Cousins rounded a form, this is going to be a scary team. Again, the NFC South looks fantastic this, this season, much better than most people expected. And so, yeah, I just wanted to talk about that. I know I did one of these last week. I don't know if I'm going to do, I don't think I'm going to do this weekly. I just, I watched a lot of football this week, and I was like, damn, I should, I like talking about football. So, again, you guys like the last one. I, again, if you guys continue to like this, maybe I'll do it weekly, just added stuff. It's easy content for me to make because I watch the football anyways. And yeah, comment down below what you want to see me do next. Make sure to like and subscribe, and YouTube thinks you're going to like this video. Find out if they're right.